Well, good morning, Walden Church. This morning, I would like to talk to you about joy because joy is a funny topic. You, you know, you'd think people would enjoy hearing about joy, but uh, it's not always a positive subject because on the one hand, we know Christians are supposed to be joyful, and yet we have this gnawing suspicion that maybe we're not as joyful as we should be. Don't get me wrong, we know what joy is, but I don't know that I feel joyful all the time. And so as a result, maybe we feel a little hypocritical. In fact, I bet that joy is one of the most commonly faked attitudes of a Christian. You may remember a few weeks ago, we looked at the importance of finding direction. And we discussed how we are all members of the body of Christ, and so that means we all participate in things together. If we experience joy, we experience it together. If we suffer, we suffer together. So as a family and as a community, God's plan for us should be to support one another, right? To lift one another up, to encourage one another, to help one another. And the only way we can do that is that if we're willing to step aside elevate the other person, humble ourselves, admit our weaknesses, and admit that maybe we're not always joyful. But we should be honest as well, because we personally understand grace. We understand that we are all sinners, and yet we are all loved and accepted by God, so therefore we can love and accept and forgive one another. Of course, there are others of us who don't even pretend to be joyful. We're just openly grumpy. Matthew 24 says, the one who endures to the end will be saved. So that's me, right? Enduring to the end. Following Christ involves persevering in faith, and I know that I do that through struggle and hardships and trials. Well, my message today is for both of you. The ones who are faking it, and the ones who are enduring. <laughs> Why is joy so hard to obtain? How do I find it? How do I keep it? First, I wanna review a few verses that show that joy should be a part of the normal Christian life. Romans 14 says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Chapter 15 says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Galatians says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. First Thessalonians says, be joyful always. So in reading those verses, do you get the impression that joy is rare or, or exclusive or elusive? I feel joy, but maybe only once in a while. You know, on special occasions, like a wedding or a birth or when the Astros are winning. But these verses say that the kingdom of God is all about joy. It's something we're to be filled with. You know, it's one of the distinguishing marks that the Holy Spirit is working in my life. And he puts it very clearly and succinctly there in 1 Thessalonians. Be joyful always. Doesn't get any more clear or direct than that. That means joy is not rare. It's not unusual, it's not uncommon, it's not exceptional. It's supposed to be what the Christian looks like and feels like all the time. And it's what we should expect in our walk with Christ. And so if our hearts possess a little joy and our lives display little joy, then maybe something is wrong. And that means we need to find out what's wrong and fix it. Now I use the term work intentionally, because one of the reasons people don't experience joy is that they fail to work at it. Now, I know that sounds a little strange, right? Working at being joyful. It seems like a contradiction in terms, like I'm gonna plan to be spontaneous. Because we tend to see joy as a basic character trait, something you either have or you don't. Or we view it as something which God does to us with little or no involvement 
on our part, right? Not something that should be sought or received. After all, I mean, if joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit, then God produces that in our hearts. So it stands to reason that he should give it to us regardless. No. And here's why. The process of maturing in the faith, growing in grace, knowledge of God, it's a cooperative effort. It's you and God working together. Yes, the joy comes from him, the power comes from him, but we have to act. We have to work. We have to draw on the power that he supplies. We have to choose to receive what he offers, not passively, actively. Listen to what Paul says about this in uh, 2 Corinthians. I call God as my witness that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, because it is by faith you stand firm. Paul wasn't waiting around for God to supernaturally zap these people with joy. He was laboring and working with them for joy. Similarly, in another place he writes, uh, therefore my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Paul tells us to work out our salvation. Now, is he talking uh, here about justification? Is he talking about earning forgiveness or meriting some sort of right standing with God by good works? No. He's talking about the process of becoming more like Christ in our hearts, in our speech, in our conduct. He's talking about the continuing process of transformation, and that takes place when we are walking in faith with Jesus. So it has two parts. We have to work. Nothing will happen unless we exercise our will and choose to obey. But at the same time, it's also God working in us. This is true, not only of just of, of joy, but of all the fruits of the Spirit whether it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, or self-control. It's absolutely true that these graces are produced by the Spirit of God working in our lives. And it's also absolutely true that none of them will become a part of our lives unless we choose to obey. Another reason people don't experience joy consistently is that they look to other people or to circumstances to supply it. And we talked a little bit about this last week. You know, they experience joy at certain times, when a child is born, or when they're on vacation, or a birthday, or an anniversary, or when they achieve some sort of, you know, milestone of success in their career. And they think that it's those kind of experiences that bring us joy. True, times like those are a blessing from God, and they do bring real joy, but it's temporary. It's fleeting, and those peak experiences don't come around often enough that we could live off of them. Because if that's the only joy that we experience, we're gonna be disappointed. We're, we're gonna pursue joy by trying to change our circumstances all the time. Then we're gonna use things like food and money and substances and other people to fulfill us. And that strategy is doomed. Any joy which is going to sustain us in the long run cannot depend on the shifting wind of circumstance. It cannot depend on pleasure or prosperity or good health or the goodwill of other people. Lasting joy, the joy that Paul and Jesus are talking about, it has to be very different. And it's built on a completely different foundation, one that's reliable, one that's lasting. What is that foundation? The foundation for true and lasting joy is built on God's promises. It's backed up by his love, his power, his truth. And the promises of God are twofold. I mean, they're uh, present promises that we experience in the world now that we live in. And then there's the future promises, the things that we look forward to. 
Why are those promises so powerful? And how can the assurances of blessings and rewards in the future give us joy now? Matthew says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Romans says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I mean, if you think about it just a little bit, it really shouldn't come as any surprise that the promise of a future good would bring you a present joy. That is, assuming that you actually believe that you will receive the things that are promised. How do people respond when they uh, hear that they win the lottery? They rejoice, right? They celebrate. They yell, they jump up and down, they dance around the room. And they do that the moment they've won. Why? I mean, right when the numbers are announced, all they have is a lottery ticket, which is a piece of paper. They don't have any money. In fact, they're probably not gonna see any money for months. Doesn't matter. Because they have complete assurances that they will receive the reward because of the promise that says that they will, they will pay the winner. And so they rejoice. You know, if there was a couple and they were hoping to conceive, as soon as the pregnancy test comes back positive, even though they're not gonna have a child or see a child for nine months, they rejoice. And we have lots of examples of this in life which show that if you have a firm confidence in the blessings of a future, that brings you joy today. And the greater the blessing, the more certain we are that we will receive it, the greater the joy. But in the case of God's promises, both of those conditions are met, right? I mean, to the highest. His promises to us are absolutely certain of fulfillment. And at the same time, they're completely wonderful. Numbers 23 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Corinthians says, for the son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. No matter how many promises you uncover, you read in the scriptures, every one of them will be fulfilled. God does not make idle promises. God doesn't make idle threats. Everything he says will come true. Ephesians 1 says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Romans 8, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Okay, looking forward to the future, finding joy, in the promise of heaven. What about, what about what I'm going through right now? That's great for the future, but what about my experience now? What of it? The sufferings that you experience in the world, as painful and as heartbreaking as they are, they do not compare with the glory and the riches that you will receive with the coming of Christ. And, and neither are the pleasures of this world comparable. What we will experience in heaven is far beyond what we will experience here, far beyond what we can even imagine here. As Paul writes, he quotes the prophet Isaiah, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Makes you wonder, right? It makes you wonder what is heaven going to be like? It's probably no surprise that people love sermons about heaven and angels and glory. We all wanna know what it's gonna be like. We all wanna know what to expect. But the truth is, we just don't know. But what we do know 
should be enough to bring you joy. First of all, it'll be a place of joy and gladness. The Bible says sorrow and grief will be unknown. No loss, nothing ruined, nothing broken, no shame, no regret, no worry about the past, no worry about the future. Only delight and gladness forever and ever. No matter what you're going through now, there's going to be a time when suffering ceases forever. Revelation says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old things have passed away. Second, it will be a place of fellowship without sin. That's key, because none of us know what that's going to be like. But in heaven, there's actually going to be no hatred, no resentment or bitterness. There's going to be no pride, no selfishness, only generosity, only sharing, no malice, no contempt, only compassion and love and kindness toward one another. Instead of people competing with each other to see who's the greatest, our desire will be to bless one another instead. The Bible says it's going to be like a banquet, a celebration, a wedding feast. Revelation 21 says, And the angel said to me, Right blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Third, we will all have new abilities, new skills, new powers. Think of the pleasure you get right now from doing something well right? From giving joy to others or when you meet somebody else's needs. Think of how you feel when you play an instrument well or you create music or you teach well so that your students understand or you serve well so that something is done well, cared for, or you built something or you made something or you discovered something. All of those gifts are expanded in the kingdom so that you'll have a vastly greater opportunity for creativity and accomplishment. We'll have a new body far superior to this, and we will live in a new heaven and a new earth. 1 Corinthians says, So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, It is raised a spiritual body. We will also have perfect fellowship with Christ. Here's the one who made heaven. And so it's with his love that makes everything worthwhile. His presence will be what makes every sacrifice here on earth worth it. So what does God want us to do? Matthew 13 says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then, in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. You know what I see? The kingdom of heaven produces joy. And that it's worth everything that you have. If you can discover the joy that the kingdom of heaven brings, it is going to produce incredible joy in you. Meanwhile, many religious people seem to lack joy. Without that joy, it'll be hard to maintain that close walk with Christ. The first step, I think, then, is to treasure the correct things in your life. Delight in the right things. You know, as Nehemiah says, do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. What does God want us to know about the kingdom of heaven? That it alone produces lasting joy. And it's possible for all of us to discover this incredible joy. I know we live in a unjust world where there is suffering. But joy is possible for everyone. If you want real treasure in life, 
then it seems to me that the starting point is not some earthly possession or a relationship. The starting point, when it's all stripped away, is that perfect fellowship with Christ. Matthew 13 says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went out and sold all that he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Jesus tells us this story to demonstrate this transaction that takes place between the believer and God. And that is, when you understand what riches you have in God, you will begin to release your hold on the things of this world. Those things do not bring you joy. Ecclesiastes 1 says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. You know, one of the things that we need to do is to ask God to open the eyes of our heart that we may see this inheritance we have in Christ. Matthew 6, Jesus says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. What does that mean? It means we should seek first the things of God. <laughs> the first call on our life should be the things that belong to God. The man in this parable gave up everything he had to buy a field that had treasure in it. We need to reorder our priorities. I think what God wants us to do is know his character, know the value of the kingdom of God. He wants us to know that that great treasure can be ours, that that great joy can be ours. And he wants us to know that he loves us and that he's always going to give us his very best. God wants us to be aware that the scam, you know, that says invest your life in temporary, invest your life in unimportant things. He wants us to be able to see through that, to recognize that all those things are temporary. They don't bring lasting joy. To live for the kingdom, to live for things that are eternal. When you and I can do that, life-changing differences, and life-altering joy. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that each one right now who's listening, each one who hears the sound of my voice, begins the path to finding real joy today. That we look forward to the promises of the future, the promise of heaven, Lord, that that alone, the knowledge that we will have perfect union with you, perfect union with each other, in a place where there is no more sorrow or worry, should be enough to bring us eternal joy forever. Lord, as each one here goes through their own struggles and trials, we pray that you comfort them and give them peace, and that you give them the strength to meet those challenges each day. We pray for those who are sick, those who are unable to come to church and be part of a fellowship. We pray that you are continually leaning, healing hands on them and allowing them to be restored. And ultimately, we pray that your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Hey, I just want to re remind you that uh, we are here in the Walden community in uh, Montgomery, Texas, and we would love to have you be a part of our community. We have two services every Sunday. The first is at 9.30. We have a choir. We're going to sing out of the hymnal. We're going to do responsive readings. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer, have communion. It's going to feel exactly like the church that you grew up in. Between our services, we've got coffee and donuts. Please come early or stay late meet one another, mix and mingle and fellowship. And then at 11 o'clock, 
We have our contemporary service. We have a worship team. Come casual, come however you feel comfortable. Bring your whole family. We've got something from birth all the way through high school, and we want to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.